Okay, the mass spectrometer, right? The mass spectrometer is a very important instrument. It has three, there could be many, but three important uh, informations that you can give you. First information is uh, in no particular order. It tells you the molar masses. Okay, it tells you the molar masses of compounds. Okay, that's number one. Then um, it also tells you, uh, it also tells you, for example, um, isotopic composition, okay? Meaning the composition of isotopes, all right? Because you see, there are all, in fact, all elements, all elements, all naturally occurring elements have isotopes. And then these naturally occurring isotopes, right? There are two types of isotopes. One are stable and the other one are, are unstable, okay? Unstable. So, if for example, like let's say chlorine, right? Chlorine has so many isotopes that there is chlorine 17, uh, sorry, there is chlorine, uh, let's say 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, so many isotopes. But chlorine has two stable isotopes. One is called chlorine um, 35, and the other one is called chlorine 37. So these are the more stable ones. There's also chlorine 36, but these are the two very stable isotopes. So the rest of them are unstable. Like for example, let's say chlorine uh, 38 or chlorine 40. Uh, these are these are unstable, meaning they do not, whenever they are present, they quickly decompose and become something else. They undergo some kind of radioactive decay and they become something else. So it tells you the isotopic composition. Like for example, like we know today, we know today chlorine 35 is approximately 75% of all the naturally occurring chlorines. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh -oh. meanwhile, chlorine 37 is about 25% of all of the naturally occurring chlorine. Okay, more or less. Uh, it's about that. So this information is given to us by this instrument, which is called the mass spectrometer. And the third information that it gives us is it gives us information about structural structural uh, formula. Okay. So it, in simple terms, it kind of tells us how a molecule looks like. It gives us uh, uh, it gives us information which uh, which allows us to predict the shape of a molecule right or a compound or a compound and these three things are very powerful right knowing the molar mass of a compound knowing the structure of a compound and um knowing isotopic compositions all right so it is a very very important uh, instrument very important instrument so the in chromatography what we do is we we have a mixture and then we separate that mixture once a mixture has been separated to the individual components, each of these components can be further analyzed. And one of the methods is mass spectrometry. Okay, one of the methods is called mass spectrometry. So for the sake of uh, explanation, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 to explain how this instrument works very, very quickly. So this is a rough idea how the instrument looks like, okay. So let's say, let's say for the fun of it, we are going to take a sample, right? So we're going to take a sample. Okay, so in this sample, uh, we have chlorine 35 and we have chlorine 37. So when I say we have a sample, right, inside of this sample, we, we don't just have one atom of chlorine 37 or one atom of chlorine 35. We have probably millions and billions and billions of chlorine atoms, chlorine molecules. That's what we have, okay? So, but the, for the sake of the explanation, I'm just going to use chlorine atoms as an example, not chlorine molecules, because that would be a little bit more complicated, okay? But let's just use chlorine atoms to make things simple. But in reality, chlorine exists as a molecule. So when it exists as molecule, right, it can be, um, it can exist as chlorine and chlorine, 35 here and 35. It can exist as uh, chlorine and chlorine, uh, 35 and 37. It can exist as chlorine and chlorine, 37 and 37. So you can have uh, a chlorine molecule, which is 70. We have one chlorine molecule, which is 72, and the other chlorine molecule, which is 74. So chlorine molecules can exist in 
three different masses okay but to make things very simple for this explanation i'm just going to focus on the fact that chlorine has two isotopes all right so we're going to ignore this part let's ignore this part we're just going to focus on chlorine atoms so let's say we have a sample and inside of this we have billions and billions and billions of um, billions and billions of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 okay so the sample enters here and then this is where the this part here is called the vaporization chamber okay vaporization chamber okay chamber this is where the sample is vaporized so what happens here is um sorry this is the this is not the vaporization chamber oops i made a mistake this is see see samples vaporizes so this is not a vaporization chamber this is actually an ionization chamber ionization chamber now what is an ionization chamber now i've got to explain this okay so let's do this again so it was not a vaporization chamber it was an ionization chamber what happens over here is okay so here we go so what happens in the ionization chamber is electrons electrons are from this this is called cathode okay this is called cathode and right here at the bottom here is let's say anode so what happens is um, electrons are shot from the cathode okay the cathode is heated up and then electrons shoot down from the cathode meanwhile our sample is moving in this direction okay so what happens is has chlorine uh, 35 and chlorine 37 they pass through they are quickly hit they are hit by this fast fast moving electrons you see the electrons are moving in that direction chlorine is moving in this direction so the angle is nearly 90 degrees when this happens right there is a possibility that the chlorine will lose an electron both the chlorines or nearly all of the chlorines will lose one electron and then it becomes a uni positive ion uni positive meaning one positive ion okay sometimes you can get sometimes you do get rarely you might get this uh -huh. you may get this so this is also a possibility getting an ion with plus two charge okay so but for the sake of uh, explanation i'm just going to stick with just plus one all right so in the ionization chamber you produce positive ions so this is what you see here la. okay is get hit by an electron and then two electrons are removed and then you get a positive ion okay you see here you get a positive ion so this is so this is what happens here then you enter this uh, this part is which is called the acceleration chamber acceleration chamber in this part the the po these positive ions are accelerated because in the acceleration chamber right this this uh, this plate here and this plate here is negatively charged so what happens is the ions that are produced are very very quickly accelerated along this and pushed this way in this direction nearly at the speed of light nearly like not not at speed of light but almost at speed of light so they are very very quickly vroom, pushed okay they are quickly pushed so now these ions are moving at really really high speed because they are being accelerated then what happens is they reach to this area here okay let me erase all of these things they reach to this area here and you see there's a bend here okay this bend is about um this bend is about 60 degrees right so the bend is at about 60 degrees if you draw a line here and you draw a line here you see this is about 60 degrees okay so there's a 60 degree bend here so what will happen is what will happen is the ions okay the ions are going to if you don't do anything right these ions will come straight and hit against the wall here that's it they're gone but the detector is at the bottom here so if there is no intervention nobody makes any disturbance or anything it will just keep hitting the wall here and then it'll just get sucked out there is a vacuum pump here they will just get sucked out so we don't want that to happen right we don't want that to happen so what happens is this area this area this whole part here is called the okay there's a magnet here there's an electromagnet here 
This is called the deflection deflection chamber. Okay, deflection chamber. So what happens is this electromagnet, right? These are these are electromagnets. Electromagnets. Okay, electromagnets. Now what happens is the strength of these electromagnets are adjusted in such a way that the ions of a particular particular mass over charge okay are allowed to hit the detector so let's say uh, only ions of a particular mass over charge like for example just now right we had chlorine which is positive and let's say 35 so mass would be 35 divided with charge plus one so 35 okay and the other one was um 37 divided with plus one so 37 so what happens is we adjust the strength of the magnetic field which is given the symbol as b so if we adjust the magnetic field as 35 okay we adjust the magnetic field and we say 35 so what will happen is only ions which are 35 will move and bend and hit the detector okay so when you adjust the strength of the magnetic field to be 35 okay b is strength of magnetic field when you adjust the strength of the magnetic field to be 35 only ions of 35 will hit the detector meanwhile meanwhile if you adjust the strength of the magnetic field to be 37 let's say now you adjust it to be 37 only ions which are 37 will bend and hit the detector the other ions will hit the wall either up there or down here so the function of the magnet is to deflect a particular ion which has a particular mass over charge okay a particular mass over charge to hit the detector so that's basically what it does so so this is called the analyzer as you can see here mass over charge and it's it, it there says here it says most of the ions should have a plus one charge okay so they should have a plus one charge and then the detector of the separated ions will measure in a vertical graph so that's the end of it okay so we get a mass spectrum that's what happens so in the case of isotopes right i think that's an example here but this example is related to boron okay with related to boron so boron uh, apparently has two isotopes one isotope is boron 10 and the other isotope is called boron 11 all right so what happens here is based on this uh, based on the experiment which was done instead of using chlorine we use boron right in this experiment what happened is it was determined that boron 10 was 19.6 percent meanwhile boron 11 was uh, 80.4 percent okay so which means that all of the borons in the world all of the borons in the world 19.6 percent are the borons 10 and 80.4 percent of the borons 11. so in the periodic table the the mass of boron which is being put in the periodic table is calculated like this we take this number here 10.013 multiply this with 19.6 divide it with 100 plus uh, this one 11.009 times 80.4 and divide this with a hundred oops that's a thousand so if you add these numbers up okay if you add these numbers up it should give you what is represented in the periodic table for boron so it's going to be 10.013 times um, 0.196 so this is going to be this is going to be 1.9625 and then the other side is going to be 11.009 times 0.804 this would be this would be 8.8512 so let's take this number plus with 1.9625 this gives me roughly 10.8 10.813736 if you look at your periodic table right boron is the molar mass of boron written in the periodic table is often taken as 10.8 okay is often taken as 10.8 so that will be the mass of boron so that is how that is how the mass spectrometer is used to determine isotopic composition right so this was the example 
so these are the various parts of the um these are the various parts of the device so as far as you are concerned as far as you are concerned for your exam purposes what do you need to know you need to know one thing so in the ionization chamber positive ions are produced that's it that's all you need to know in the acceleration chamber the positive ions are accelerated at very high speeds then in the deflection chamber the ions are deflected and deflected towards the detector by adjusting the magnetic field based on the mass over charge ratio that means the strength of the magnetic field would be adjusted based on the mass over charge ratio and the detector detects the ions detects how many of a particular ion is present in the sample okay how many of um of a particular ion is present in the sample that's the job of the detector okay so we'll stop here and then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how uh, the mass spectrum sorry the mass spectrometer can be used to determine the uh, structure of organic compounds okay